Hello, folks. This lecture is going to be on mirrors, the technology, history, key people behind the U.S. Magnetic Mirror Program, which essentially runs from 1970, late 1960s, to 1987, with some work going on in Russia and then a recent, recent resurgence uh, in the United States and in France. Mirrors, uh, the history of mirrors... Uh, it's really unfortunate because for almost a generation, it was kind of forgotten because of the prominence of ICF and Tokamax as the premier um, methods for getting fusion power. But the MIRA program had a rich history, and at one time was one of the main efforts within the United States. And unlike many fusion concepts, the MIRA program can start with the work of one gentleman named Dick Post. Dick Post uh, is originally from California, he went to Pomona College, and in the 1950s was a graduate student at the University of uh, Berkeley, California, UC Berkeley. And he went to a lecture uh, and was challenged to develop an approach for controlled nuclear fusion by uh, one of his advisors. And as a graduate student, Dick Post in the early 1950s started pondering the different ways that you could cold the plasma steady and came up with the magnetic mirror concept, which at the time he was exceedingly passionate about. Like many people in this field who become enamored with a specific approach, um, people get really fired up about that, that field. And there's plenty of examples of that. Robert Broussard, uh, Dick Post, uh, Dennis White, uh, Ralph Moyer, uh, Uri Shermalak, uh, Eric Lerner, these uh, people in, in the fusion space that just believe wholeheartedly in their concept, and Richard Post was, was just like that. So he started working at the Livermore National Laboratory uh, in the 60s, late 50s, early 60s, and developed the idea of the mirror machine. And he wrote a series of papers on the idea. So a basic mirror is... Uh, essentially two magnetic fields that reflect particles. The reflection occurs because of something called the mirror effect. As a particle moves from a low density magnetic field to a high density magnetic field, it experiences a Lorenz force, which causes it to corkscrew around uh, the magnetic field line. So you can think of a particle like a, just take a typical ion, imagine it going clockwise around a magnetic field and traveling down this magnetic field, which is a low density uh, field where the lines are pretty far apart. And then the flux and the magnetic field gets tighter and tighter and tighter. And what happens is as that happens, the, the particle starts corkscrewing much faster and the, 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 the number of turns gets closer together. So it kind of scrunches together as it goes further along. And eventually under certain conditions, the particle will flip directions. The magnetic moment along the line will flip directions and the particle will be reflected off of that magnetic field and continue corkscrewing out, uh, out into the low density field lines. So I say under certain conditions because the effect doesn't work all the time. If the uh, approach of the, the helical turn is uh, at a high enough pitch angle, it will leak through. And the way they model this is they have something called the loss cone. So it's a three-dimensional representation in mathematical space of particles and things inside the lost cone have a high enough pitch angle that they get lost. Things outside the lost cone are not lost and they are reflected. So that's a mirror coil. It's essentially, in the most basic sense, the basic magnetic mirror is, uh, think of a coil, a ring, a magnetic ring that gets tighter as you get to the end of the mirror, causing that low density to high density transition where particles are easily contained and then they go to the mirror and they get reflected and they get sent back. And you put two of those coils facing each other and essentially you've got particles that bounce off one mirror, go across the machine, bounce off the other side, go across the machine, bounce off the other side, and they bounce back and forth and back and forth. And as they crisscross in the center, they hopefully collide and fuse. That's the basic concept of a mirror machine. 
It's two magnetic coils that face one another uh, and, and have plasma bounce back and forth between the two in a linear facet fashion with stuff colliding in the center uh, and hopefully fusing. So some of the bigger machines were about the size of a school bus. Um, the MFTF, which was the biggest machine that was ever built in the mirror program, was the size of a double-decker school bus. So you're talking something on the order of 30 to 40 feet high, and then maybe uh, you know uh, the length of a school bus or two school buses uh, long. So very large vacuum machines uh, with that. So that's your basic mirror coil that Dick Post proposed in uh, the late 1960s. So he was at Livermore, and this uh, event, his proposal, collided with the oil crisis in 1972. The Carter, Carter administration uh, was suddenly hit with a major problem when OPEC decided to cut off supplies as protests for an attack uh, that the United States coordinated with Israel. Uh, as a consequence, uh, the U.S. was suddenly thrust into a situation where gas supplies were really hard to find. Energy was suddenly top of the list for every le legis legislator, legislative person and the administration. And there was a lot of concern because at the time, America imported a lot of its energy uh, from outside oil supplies. And this is a concern for the Defense Department, because what happens if a foreign affairs adversary wanted to suddenly cut off energy supplies to the United States. I mean, it would cripple the military and economic might of the U.S. So suddenly the U.S. and the Defense Department were very interested in funding all kinds of uh, energy projects, wind, solar, uh, and fusion. And also the Alaskan pipeline was funded at that time. So fusion got a lot of money uh, because of that and because of the Cold War, the competition with the Soviets. And um, by 1972, uh, Tokamaks were already a prime uh, candidate. We'd already seen um, breakthrough work in the Tokamak world. Mirrors were another one that the U.S. threw a lot of money into. So if there was a golden age for nuclear fusion research in the United States, I would probably pick between 1972 and 1986 or 87. Uh, and I would probably pick Livermore, California as the best place to be at that time because of the amount of money going into the mirror program. This wasn't a small program. This was a large program. Thousands upon thousands of engineers, scientists, plasma physicists, and control engineers were involved in the development of the mirror. And there were a variety of uh, satellite projects uh, at Columbia, Wisconsin, Texas, MIT, uh, and other places that were studying and supporting mirror technology. So it was a time when we really tried as a nation to get nuclear fusion happening in, in, the, re, in, in the real world. Uh, and it's a shame because, uh, because of what follows after 1987, 70, 80, 87, 86, um, the Reagan administration basically cuts the funding and then fusion kind of goes into a dark age for about a generation. Uh, and it also coordinates with the birth of cold fusion, which throws a lot of shade all over the whole field because everyone starts to write fusion off as impossible and not an energy technology, but more of a science kind of idea, less, less urgency. So, but anyway, back to 1972, Dick Post comes up with this idea. And Livermore receives a series of funding to develop a series of mirror machines. Uh, they do uh, baseball one, which is where they test out a specific um, mirror coil. Now, just to go a little bit detailed about baseball one and baseball two, um, the mirror machine that I described earlier were concentric rings. And I described how a particle going into a concentric ring would move into a denser field and then be reflected back. So there are ways to craft the magnetic field uh, such that you could get better um, reflection for particles. And baseball one was one attempt to do that. Essentially, it's two saddle coils that are linked together in the shape of a baseball. And the joke around the Livermore Labs was that the Americans thought about it because they play baseball and the Russians do not. Uh, it was a very innovative design for a mirror coil, and the Americans built it and tested it at the time. 
Um, the Russians developed something called Iafi bars. Iafi bars were an evolution over the baseball coil. And uh, we're probably showing a picture of that. Uh, the Americans got that technology from the Russians uh, and then started to adopt it at their Livermore facility. And so they started building, they built a machine called 2X, 2X2, and then the magnetic mirror uh, experiment. TMX, and then they went to the magnetic mirror experiment upgrade TMXU, and then they built the MFTF after that. So I just laid out a series of machines, which, like all fusion programs, you know, there's four or five, six machines in succession where they're attempting to improve the performance based off of data that they get. Uh, and this sort of this iterative cycle where you build a machine, you test it, you improve your diagnostics, you get more data. You improve your theory based off the data, and then based off the data and the theory, you can predict uh, a better regime to go to. So you, then you get a whole bunch of money and start building a new machine to get to that, re that regime. And from 1972 to 1986, Livermore participated in the construction of probably a dozen different experiments around mirrors, either the mirrors itself or some sort of supporting technology. And they farmed out or outsourced a lot of the modeling stuff and um, other, t other designs were tested at multiple universities around the country. This, by the way, also correlated with when Robert Hirsch was in charge of the fusion efforts at the Department of Energy, which was um, the Atomic Energy Commission and then became the Department of Energy under Carter. Uh, Robert Hirsch, uh, very um, powerful force for fusion, advocate for fusion. Uh, in that generation, uh, and if folks who are interested in fusion now should look him up, he's a, kind of a, he should be a mentor to all of us. Uh, he really stepped up the amount of effort in fusion and wanted to make it a more national conversation. Um, I mean, he was a, a leader, essentially, and pushed the Department of Energy to get into all these different advanced stuff. He also organized a documentary in 1980, which is a really good documentary. You should check it up on YouTube which does a rare example where they definitely tried to explain nuclear fusion concepts to the general public. And they got Neil Armstrong to do an opening uh, remarks in front of the Rochester Museum of Science Center in Rochester, New York, where I'm from. But they talked about mirrors, and they talked about tokamaks, and they talked about stellarators, and they talked about a variety of different fusion approaches. Um, so they, didn't, they made a movie that was really uh, about the science, and they really did try to support multiple approaches which is so light years better than what we see today, where we just see one video about tokamaks and they don't even really explain the tokamaks. Anyway, look them up, Robert Hirsch. So Livermore embarks on this mirror program. And like I said, they have the coil, the, the baseball coil, the IAFI bar uh, as ways to improve uh, the mirror machine. They also move into an area called tandem mirrors, which is where you have a compartment uh, a magnetic field that basically traps a bunch of plasma in the back of the mirror and you try to make the plasma electrically biased so it's like more negative or more positive based on what's in there and that you you're basically adding an electrostatic repulsion effect to the mirror approach that you've got going there so it's a little bit more nuanced but it, this is the kind of um, complexity that they were trying to build into the mirror program and it really shows an evolution in thinking about um, all the different creative ways that they can improve performance. Um, ultimately, though, the whole approach gets scrapped uh, at the end of, of 1986. One of the offshoots of the MIRA program that I'm particularly proud of uh, and I find very interesting is the work done by William Pickles and Ralph Moyer. Ralph Moyer is another character uh, who has a prominent role in the development of the mirror machine at, at Livermore National Laboratory. And he's still alive today. He's uh, got a website and he's involved in advanced small modular reactors. Um, his training is traditionally by uh, fission reactors and he was sort of the nuclear guy that came into the fusion program and became the right hand man of Edward Teller, um, of all people. So I actually went out to visit uh, Dr. Moyer uh, in 2016 or 17 or 15 or 16, excuse me, um, at his house in Livermore, California. And he's the author of over 180 papers. Uh, and he was the right hand man of Edward Teller, like I said, and has all kinds of exotic and fun stories about Edward Teller. Edward Teller believed uh, that if he put himself in barometric chambers, he could extend his life or fight his disease. So he 
you'd go to his house and there'd be a barometric chamber out in front of his lawn with uh, gas cylinders around. Uh, this was like in the early 2000s uh, towards the end of his life. Uh, but he had some very kooky, uh, kooky things and kooky stories around him. And Ralph Moyer was, was there to see all these things. Um, so William Pickles and Ralph Moyer worked on an approach called uh, an energy capture approach called directed, uh, direct energy conversion. Direct energy conversion is an exciting idea where material coming off a fusing plasma is at a very high potential energy because it's so hot. The helium ion that just came off the reaction is really, really hot. So if you fire a beam of particles at a piece of metal that's just coming off a fusion reactor reaction, um, it creates a very high potential energy in one spot. So 30 million or 3 million, excuse me, uh, electron volts is a good rule of thumb for this. So direct conversion basically harnesses this capability as a co energy conversion approach. Particles come off, they hit the metal at, at some point. Um, well, excuse me, back, I mean, back up. Particles come off, you apply magnetic and electric fields to sort of beat them into submission. So you kind of collimate them, get them going in the right direction, and maybe do some sort of charge separation so you have just the positives or just the negatives, and then fire them into a, a metal wall. And what happens is that point on the metal wall is held at a high voltage, which means that you have a 3 million volt point in an electrical circuit that's consistent and steady. And that allows for current to flow elsewhere in the circuit. So that's the concept. That's direct conversion. You have material coming off, ions at a high voltage, high potential energy. It's kind of beat into submission and collimated. It goes into a wall. It creates a point that's 3 million degrees, 3 million volts. And that allows for electrical current flow elsewhere in the circuit. So that's the basic idea. It's a very interesting idea. Livermore developed it as part of the the, the tandem mirror experiment, TMXU upgrade, uh, in 1978, 79, 80, 81, 82, that sort of time frame. Um, and the way they did was they started with uh, just a particle beam. So they created a test setup where they had a particle beam going into a piece of metal, and then they applied all these um, plates that had charges on them to redirect just the negatives or just the positives in one way or another to kind of collimate the beam and get just the positives going into the wall so that you could create a positive 300, 3 million volt uh, potential. They called it the Venetian blind um, approach. In, in, in fact, if you read their papers, it says Venetian blind in the title. But because the because Venetian blinds are strips of metal, and this was essentially strips of metal around a particle beam uh, in a test stand. So William Pickles, Ralph Moyer did that work uh, and they built a whole series of machines and they got funding and wrote a whole series of papers around it. And then they ended up um, adding that capability to the TMXU uh, experiment. So they did experiments off of a mirror machine doing fusion and collecting this material uh, in one place. So two things that were exciting about that work. One, they showed a 47% conversion efficiency, which is really incredible when you think about power plants today. A typical power plant today is 25% to 60%. Maybe the world's most efficient gas plants are 60%. So a 47% conversion of, of energy is incredible. Now, it's 47%, but it's 47% of the 20% that's coming off of the fusion reaction as energy in the ions. Most of the energy coming from fusion leaves as neutrons. About 80% of it leaves as neutrons. So direct conversion isn't as exciting as you might initially think. Um, one of the other problems with direct conversion, so that's, that's one problem, is that you're getting 47% of 20%, which is really only 10% of the fusion power, right? So it's not as great as a thermal blanket, um, but it, it has that advantage that it's a single step process. Uh, so, so pluses and minuses on that technology. And I think it needs to be more thoroughly explored and direct conversion as an approach has ended up in a couple other different concepts. It's used in um, uh, pacemakers. It's been used in pacemakers where 
you put a radioactive element in uh, a box and then the radioactive element emits particles that are high potential, they hit the surface and create basically a high voltage point that causes electricity to flow elsewhere. So you can make a, like Alpha V was a company that came up with this idea uh, that built a battery around that. And um, there's other applications for space batteries as well. But so that's one of the, that's one of the ideas that sort of take took direct conversion work and went in a different direction with it. One of the disadvantages I was going to say was there's a stream of neutrons coming off the fusion reaction as well. And so the neutrons go into the metal and they beat things up. They make stuff radioactive. They cause cracking. They cause swelling. Uh, they cause transmutation, uh, and they can cause secondary emissions uh, because the thing is radioactive. So that's a problem, um, and that really does screw up your direct conversion approach over time because uh, you're depending on a solid surface to stay at a potential, and it's being uh, eroded by the um, stream of neutrons that are coming off the fusion reactor, reaction. But... Direct conversion work, very exciting offshoot of the mirror program with other applications. And uh, Ralph Moyer was a big part of that, very famous physicist um, whose story I don't think gets told enough. So the mirror program was an exciting program with thousands of people employed in it. And it culminated in the design, development, and construction of the Magnetic Fusion Test Facility, the MFTF which was $376 million when it was finally finished in 1986. It was the most expensive uh, experimental machine ever built by Livermore National Laboratories to that date. So in the lab of known for big machines where, um, and that was one of Livermore's, the ori um, Livermore's original idea was he was gonna build big machines to do fusion experiment or to do experiments of all kinds. MFTF was the largest machine ever built. And it was finished in 1986 under the Reagan administration. And when Reagan came in in 1980, you know, his philosophy was um, the biggest problem is government. Government is the problem. And what he meant by that was that he wanted to uh, simplify and strip away a lot of big government programs that he didn't think the government the the country was really benefiting from and one of them was the fusion program and principal among that was the mirror program so this was a technical down select uh that the nation was making and it killed off not just mirrors but also frc research pinch research and other fusion research programs from around the country at various universities and national labs uh, and in one of my podcast episodes, if you check it out, thefusionpodcast.com, I interviewed Dr. Robert Terry, who was uh, uh, at NRL at the time and talks about this. He said he was at the APS meeting and the Department of Energy showed up and essentially said, we are going to down select to Tokamax uh, and ICF. And he, he was of the opinion that it was the dumbest idea ever and that they were fusion was not at a place where technical down selection was a good idea uh and I, I tend to agree with that thought um there are gems and there are good ideas in the past that have been underfunded or um, basically killed off uh that fusion we should recognize as having value uh just because they're not tokamax doesn't mean they don't have value and that's part of why resurrecting all this history is important uh, for the generation of folks that are going into fusion now, private fusion. So the MFTF was slated for closure and they came to Livermore and essentially told the staffers that were working on it that, hey, when we finish this thing, we're going to shut it down. And at the time, it was hundreds of people uh, working in all aspects of the reactor, designing the magnets, building the magnets, shipping the magnets, building the vacuum vessel, designing the diagnostics, designing the power system, designing the control system. Um, the, the control system is a little, a special little uh, case because uh, it was a good way to develop uh, advanced circuitry for reactor controls and reactor feedback and computer control and computer feedback in the early 80s when that wasn't commonplace and a lot of the folks that did work on that system 
ended up just moving over to Silicon Valley and getting involved in the computer industry. So it's another example of where fusion R&D research dollars did grow innovation outside of fusion, and it did help grow uh, the U.S. computer and electronics industry. So they did, they had a big uh, party <laughs> to celebrate the finishing of the MFTF. Uh, they had balloons and streamers and cakes and, and, uh, and then the next day everybody quit and was fired and had to go out and get a new job. <laughs> so it's a kind of a historic day in, uh, in fusion history. Uh, I think it's February, 1986 when this occurred. Uh, when the MFTF was successfully opened and shut down on the very same day. Uh, the most expensive project in Livermore history to that date and probably uh, could have been a heck of a machine for the progress of nuclear fusion if we'd ever even tried to turn it on once. Uh, I think it would have been very exciting. Uh, but yeah, we, we shut that program down at the same day. So the MFTF actually became uh, a giant coffin and uh, it was eventually uh, harvested for parts for a variety of other experiments going on at the Livermore National Laboratory. Uh, Science uh, wrote a great article on the history of all this uh, with inter interviews with the program managers involved. One other thing I would say about mirrors before I close is that they were uh, exciting in another respect that um, superconducting materials were tried on the mirror program. Uh, and that's something that sort of gets forgotten today that HTS is not, not terribly, not necessarily all new in fusion. There was some superconducting work applied, uh, to, uh, fusion machines, uh, specific, specifically mirror machines. So with the fall of mirrors, uh, that represented the rise of ICF and Tokamak as the premier uh, facility uh, and approach in the United States. Uh, and mirrors can, persisted in other countries. So most notably in Russia, uh, there's a machine called the gas dynamic trap in Russia that uh, continued and has now since overcome a number of the flaws of mirror machines in the past. They can now get better confinement. They can get higher densities and higher temperatures. Uh, in the 2017, th uh, three gentlemen who were involved in the mirror program, uh, Kenneth Fowler, uh, uh, Dr. Simon Simone, and Ralph Moyer, came together to write a uh, two-pager argument piece that basically argued that the United States needs to get back into the mirror program uh, because the because of all the progress made in, at the Russian gas dynamic trap um, out in Russia, and and basically all these approaches, all these problems that we were encountering back in the 80s have now been solved. And furthermore, if you combine it with high temperature superconductors, you can get these great uh, performance enhancements. And so they three U.S. researchers were basically arguing that the United States needs to get back into mirrors. Now, the argument against mirrors has a long history as well. Um, most famously, Larry Linsky, who was a professor at the MIT Nuclear Engineering Department, um, wrote a, spoke before Congress in the 80s on mirrors and argued that they were a terrible idea and they would never work. And um, I think his comment was uh, every generation of mirrors, they try to add more rings and the thing gets bigger and heavier and more expensive and it just doesn't work. Uh, and he was famous for that quote uh, in Congress. Uh, There's a corrected quote up there. Um, after the 2017 paper by uh, Fowler, Simone, and other folks, there was more uh, attention around mirrors, especially at Wisconsin. And uh, RPE started funding mirror research uh, with the GAMAO. Uh, and beta programs uh, this year. So it, it's very exciting that we now have dun, 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 very, we now have a new mirror program under construction in Wisconsin. Okay, folks, thanks a lot. Hope you're enjoying the lecture series. Take care.